Yep, I just did it. Hey, you guys, we're, we haven't started yet, but I just wanted to just set it up. And so we won't start until probably two or three minutes after one. Just give those stragglers a chance to come in. Meanwhile, if you want to ask any questions or use the chat window, feel free to do that. I see there's some people in the room, and we'll get going, I guess, in just a minute or two. Welcome to the uh, to the session. We'll get going in just a couple minutes as more people arrive. And also, this is not Benet. This is Kira Tiana Freeland. <laughs> but she, our account is under Benet.
I'm ready whenever. Yeah, ready. let's start. I guess, yeah. um, yep, it's 103. Let's start. Um, so I'll just um, introduce um, our presenter, wonderful presenter. So I want to thank you guys for, um, you know, taking time out of this, out of your day before a wonderful holiday weekend to learn about some new tools um, from Jeremy Kaplan. Um, Jeremy Kaplan actually gave a similar presentation last year for the New Year, New Year, New Year, New Year pro program, which was very popular. And so we decided to bring it back. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you guys are familiar with Jeremy Kaplan, but just let me give you an overview of, of his background. He's actually the director of education for the Tao Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the City University of New York Graduate School of Journalism, which I just completed last December. And the Tao Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism is this wonderful place where every um, spring semester, journalists who may want to just take a, month, uh, take a semester to kind of work on an entrepreneurial idea that they have, they come to the school. Um, and they take classes with Jeremy, Jeremy, they spend time going to wonderful startups in New York City, and at the end, they have an, an idea that they are ready to start pitching and, and developing. And so he is the director of education for that, and he was actually still right, but he used to focus on business and technology journalism at Time Magazine, um, and has also was also a fellow at Columbia Business School, was also a Knight Bagel Fellow, so he's obviously has some serious chops. And whenever I want to find out what is the newest tool that I can use in journalism, I go to Jeremy. So that's why we're bringing him back. So Jeremy, do you want to take it? Sure. Thanks, Karatan. A very nice intro. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm excited to talk about these tools and resources and services and trends. These are things that I think are interesting to be aware of for the year ahead. And some of them are specific tools that you can use in creating something. Others of them that I'm going to mention are things that other people are using, are stories that people have done in interesting ways, so a variety of different kinds of highlights. And I'm going to move through a whole bunch of different things, and I'm going to move relatively quickly because we've just got an hour, but uh, you should know that all of the links that I'm going to mention and all the examples, etc., are at this URL, which is bit.ly slash ninja next. And just while we're starting out, I want to just check in um, to make sure that you all can see the screen that I'm showing and hear me adequately. Um, so if you're having any difficulty, you can um, mention something in the chat window. You can also ask questions in the chat window. And Karatia, I'm just making sure with you that you can see the screen adequately and you can hear yep. me, et cetera. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. So I will check in periodically to see if there are questions, um, which you should feel free to post in the chat or question window. Um, as part of the webinar, and otherwise I'm just going to move forward and talk uh, about a whole bunch of different things. I hope at least some of these will be of, of interest to, uh, to each and every one of you. So again, if you want to reference the links or even the slides um, later on, you can go to bit.ly slash ninja next. So uh, just a bit again, you heard from Kiratiana about me. I'm a journalist, but I'm really interested in the future of journalism and how storytelling is changing. And I have a, a daughter who uh, who is going to be, uh, you know, part of the, this next generation of news consumers? And so, for me, it's it's very important to think about how news and media is changing and how how that's going to impact our lives in the future. And so, I have a, both a professional and a personal interest in this subject matter. And today, I'm going to mention some things that um, have to do with new ways that journalism is created, as well as new ways it's distributed, the new ways it's it's enjoyed and experienced and shared. And, uh, and then I'm going to look ahead at some things that you may not have seen yet, but that I think are coming next. If you go to the bit.ly slash ninja next, you'll see that there's an outline for this session, and it includes uh, these, these sections. So if you're interested in sort of getting a sense of where we're heading, these are some of the topics that you're going to see. And, and if you go to that link, you'll see uh, the links and, and be able to access those either as we move along in this session or afterwards at your leisure if you, if you prefer. So the first thing I want to talk about is what I call next generation video. And we all know about YouTube and the growth of, of video in terms of the popularity of people viewing videos both on YouTube and in various news contexts. And, and what I'm actually interested in is what's happening next. And what I call next generation video is, is slightly different from the video that many of us have spent so much time watching in recent years. It's interactive. And that means that there are paths that you can follow, somewhat like choose your own adventure videos. 
Um, there are links and layers of text, annotations, tweets, Wikipedia entries, Google Maps, other things that are laid on top of these videos and that enable you to do more with the video rather than just sit back and passively watch. I want to give you a few examples of platforms that let you do this. And, and these are basically open to anyone. So anyone who's interested in this can dive in and start creating videos in this really exciting new way. Recontour is, to me, the most exciting of the platforms because it's very simple to use and actually free to use, but very powerful. So it allows you to do all kinds of interesting things. And because we're limited in time, I won't be able to show you the actual video examples. But if you go to Recontour, R-A-C-O-N-T-R dot com, you can actually see a whole range of, of examples in their showcase of projects that use this interactive approach. And they really do some interesting things, from layering text over the videos to allowing you to use music and interactivity in a variety of different ways. Oh. So they're really simple. It's a really simple tool, actually. Once you get the, the initial hang of it, it's it's much like um, much like other platforms that you may have used to create interactive um, projects. And you basically drop in some video. You decide what text you want to layer over it. If you want to add tweets or other things to it, you can do that. And it's it's quite a powerful platform. It can be used uh, at a professional level by networks, and it's used actually by a, new, a number of European news networks already. It comes out of France, so it's gotten an early lead there. But it can be used by anyone across the world, even individuals who just want to create something interesting. So I encourage you to check that out. Again, it's called Recontour. And you can see on this screen, you can see a variety of networks that have already started using it, like Le Monde and Radio France in, in, in France and other organizations around, around Europe and around the world. There are a couple of videos that they have, too, which allow you to see um, in great detail kind of examples of how, how that's used, um, which I'll let you watch uh, on your own if you're interested in pursuing that. So you know, we used to think of just, just sort of the, the, the trendy videos and the shareable videos as what's, what's kind of the, the main dialogue around video. But I think next we're going to think about new ways that people are using video for interactivity. Kettlecorn is another interesting platform. It, it's a spun off of something called Mozilla Popcorn, which was a free open source platform that allowed people to take a video and lay over text, kind of like pop-up videos. Those of you who remember VH1 pop-up videos with little text that would appear on, on top of the video. So Popcorn, Mozilla's Popcorn project allowed you to do that. And then they also soon allowed you to lay a Google map on top of something. If you were showing where something happened, then you could add Flickr images or Flickr slideshow. And Gradually, the project became something useful for journalists. And so off of that project forked a new project called Kettlecorn. And that's aimed at journalists and allows you to add lower thirds. So you can really use it for creating professional quality journalism videos that just happen to have cool elements layered on top. And it's completely free to use, really easy, very um, quick start. You could get started and create your first project in 10 minutes, um, assuming you have a video to work with, obviously. Um, but it allows you to take any, any video you already have and to layer interesting material on top of it. Uh, and you can see, here's, the, here's an example of the Popcorn Maker um, screen, the, the dashboard. And you essentially just drop in elements. So it's really, really easy to use. Another of these inter interactive um, video networks is called Clint. It, this is actually a software tool. So both Popcorn and um, Recontour are both web-based. Clint is actually a piece of software, kind of like Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere, if you're familiar with those primary video editing tools, or, or Avid. This is one that you download and allows you to not edit the video, because the assumption is you're going to edit them using Final Cut or Premiere or some other tool, but layer on different elements. So you can combine multiple videos and have a kind of choose-your-own-adventure style project. You can have a gallery where you have a bunch of different videos and allow people to choose which video they watch. So there's a lot of different things you can do with it. And all kinds of um, organizations around the world are starting to use um, Clint, much as many are also using a contour. Happy X is another example of one. There's really a bunch of these that are just getting started. Um, one is called Wrapped, R-A-P-T. 
and uh, there are just a whole range of these popping up. So it's an exciting year for interactive video, and, and I'm, I'm really eager to see what happens next with that. So that's the first category. I want to just pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions or if any comments there. Um, feel free to use the chat window if you do have comments or questions. Um, if I don't see any, I'm just going to plow forward. And, um, and I want to remind, I know a few people have joined um, since we began, so I'm going to paste in the link here, which is um, bit.ly slash ninja next. For anyone who's just joining us, you can follow along with the links or refer back to the links later on at that URL. OK, so I'm going to continue with this next section, which is um, I call snow flurries. And the idea here is that you know I've been talking about interactive video. But one thing that's interesting is that there's a, a movement to create really high quality immersive stories using these platforms. So the tools are one thing, but the actual stories that are, people are creating are a whole other thing. And I'm sure many of you have heard about Snowfall, which is the New York Times famous project last year. But there's a whole range of interesting new projects that have come after that. And there are all sorts of interesting new interactive documentaries. This one um, is a, very, a really fascinating story that allows you to choose which, it's called Bear 71, it allows you to see which elements of the, of the piece are of most interest to you. And you can choose the order in which you view things. Snowfall, as you probably know, allowed you to read a story while watching short videos and listening to little audio clips um, without having to leave the page. So it was really an immersive experience that gave you an in-depth story. And other examples of this include Firestorm, which was a project of The Guardian, a really engaging, interesting project that included video and audio and a really great story. Vanish was a project using a different platform um, done by the Atavist. And this was about a guy trying to essentially get off the grid and, and what would it be like to try to hide and to see if people could find him, essentially. Um, and uh, he made a game out of it and let people try to track him um, digitally, which was kind of interesting. And the idea is to combine text with video and to design it in such a way that the experience is really immersive. You're not distracted by pop-ups or ads you're able to really immerse yourself in the experience and enjoy the story. And it's something that's happening more and more and more. Narratively is a project that came out of our program at the Town Night Center and was founded um, in the past couple of years and focuses on this kind of immersive storytelling. So you can see here a story that fills up the entire screen. There's large photos, large text, easy to read experience. And this is part of this new generation of storytelling projects that are focused on making the story and the text and the video and the images what's primary and not distracting the viewer or the reader with an excess of lists or an excess of ads or an excess of pop-ups or other distracting material. And I would say there are a few things that characterize this new snow flurry approach of, of immersive storytelling. Um, the first is that design is of primary interest. Journalists talk a lot about editing and writing and shooting and doing all those things, but design is of growing importance as people decide what they're going to spend time looking at online. And so that's a key part of this new immersive storytelling movement. And in-depth stories are obviously stories that really get past the surface of a subject. And then thirdly, that the stories um, take advantage of multimedia, so in many cases beautiful photography, in some cases audio that's really engaging, or video. And there are a lot of projects, a lot of new sites that are actually doing interesting things with, with storytelling. Um, Mike is one, I think, that's doing really interesting things and is one to watch in 2015, as is Quartz, which is focused on business journalism but is making it accessible with different kinds of stories. Vox, as many of you I'm sure know, is focused on explainers, so getting behind the essence of the news and explaining it, as is uh, 538, which focuses on using data to do that. So all these projects are using stories in different ways, capturing different kinds of elements of stories to really get us immersed in the, the content in new ways. The Marshall Project is a really exciting new one that's going to really uh, be, I think, on our radar much more in 2015. They're focused exclusively on the criminal justice system, and they're headed up by the former editor of the New York Times, Bill Keller. So that's one that I think we haven't heard a lot about so far, um, 
but we, we, we've seen their initial project was really great, and we're going to hear a lot more about the Marshall Project in, in 2015. The Intercept has, has been somewhat controversial, um, but I think First Look Media in general is going to be um, expanding in 2015. It's going to be a source of some interesting new stuff. So there's a variety of, of new platforms, new sites that are looking at storytelling in new ways and I think are, are really exciting ones to watch in 2015. So that's section two. Uh, the next section is about interactive images. So the idea here is that uh, images can be a lot more than photos. And one of the great new tools that I'm really excited about is called InfoActive. It allows you to create really great infographics, really great charts, and to blend text into those charts so you can explain what it is that people are looking at. Really easy to use, really, really elegantly designed. There are a variety of others um, that allow you to create cool infographics using templates. So one of those is visual.ly, easel.ly, it's another one, Infogram. Again, all these links are at the bit.ly slash ninja next um, link. So I won't um, I won't go through each and every one in great detail. But the idea here is that these are allowing you to create really cool infographics in, in interesting ways. PictoChart is one that's also very easy to use and allows you to use infographics, create infographics. Thinglink is one that I've, I've really liked for a while. And, and basically, the idea is to just lay on top of an image um, links or materials that are relevant to someone looking at that image. So in this case, we're approaching um, Martin Luther King Day. Um, this is a photo of Martin Luther King, and if you hover over it when you're using ThingLink, you can see a video of, of um, something. You can also look at a Wikipedia entry. Um, you can see other related photos. You can find other historical information related to this event, and that's all up to the creator. It can decide what um, he or she links to on top of a photo. So it really allows you to make a photo more interactive. And it's as simple as basically clicking on the image and adding a link to it. So it doesn't take any programming or coding. And then that interactive image can then be embedded, just like a YouTube video can be embedded. So it's super, super simple to use. It's free to use and really easy. So um, one I recommend definitely for adding something to, to the images that you're, you're creating in, in, in the year ahead. A couple of resources, a couple of sites that I find really interesting in how they're using images. Newsbound is one that does explainers, basically in um, kind of PowerPoint style, but really nice, nicely designed. So it's basically they explain an issue by, um, by means of a series of visuals. So you can kind of click through a stack of cards, kind of like the Vox card stacks, um, except more elegantly designed, I think, at the moment. And you can click through the, these and see um, different stories. Um, it's different stories explained. Vox that has these card stacks that I just mentioned, which are really quite, quite elegant um, and, and actually allow you to get an understanding of any issue and you can add to them. And it's kind of a, an interesting visual way to organize a story. Um, and here's an example of uh, a story about the Ebola crisis. And uh, it's broken up into these visual cards, which make it really easy to see a story and understand it. Another example of a tool that's really useful for creating really great interactive visuals is Timeline.js out of the Night Lab at Northwestern, which has some really great free projects, open source projects. They've done a fantastic job creating free tools for journals to use that are both really easy and really powerful. Timeline.js allows you to create essentially a simple timeline, but you can include in the timeline Flickr images, YouTube videos, Vimeo videos, all sorts of other elements that um, make the timeline more engaging to, to the viewer. And you can do it all by just creating a simple Google spreadsheet. And they give you a template, and all you do is drop in the info and the links. This is StoryMap, another project out of, uh, out of the Night Lab, a little bit more recent one, that allows you to tell a story over a map, which is really interesting when you have stories that have geographic context. So you can see on this screen an example of a story where there, there's a whole range of materials um, layered on top of the map. And you, as the creator, can structure it in the way that you want to. BDocs is another really cool timeline tool that I really like. It's a software tool, so you actually download it. And um, there's a low-cost version and a higher-cost version. And they're both really powerful. One of the things they allow you to do is do three-dimensional timelines, if you can imagine that. So the the viewer sort of feels like they're kind of moving forward into across time. It's, it's a pretty cool effect. 
and these can be embedded online as well. So it's a nice al alternative to TimelineJS and, and even easier to use, I would say, than, than TimelineJS. <laughs> So um, I'm going to pause there, um, and um, I, I um, just want to see if there are any questions thus far. I know I've mentioned a f bunch of different things so far. Um, and again, you can use the chat window to share any questions or thoughts. I'd love to hear any questions or reactions or thoughts you have about any of that stuff um, as, we, um, as we get ready to go into this next section, which focuses on hands-on kind of tools that you can use. So please feel free to, uh, to chime in with any questions or, or um, add any thoughts to the chat window. Kiratiana, you're included in that. If okay, you cool. Applications, please feel free to, to, to chime in. Um, I have a question. Sure, please. Which, well, one, which of, you've gave it, Put out a, a long list of tools. Which one of these are you the most excited about? Well, I'm about to dive into a whole another section with additional <laughs> tools, um, and and there there really are lots of different tools for different purposes. So it's kind of like a toolbox at home. You know, you might like using the hammer because it feels good to kind of release the 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 energy sometimes, um, but that doesn't mean you'd use the hammer for everything. So in the same way, you know, their their Recontour is a great tool for interactive video, and I really like using that. I like using ThingLink when I'm doing a, a picture and adding links to it. Um, so for different purposes, I like using different tools. Um, in terms of organization, my favorite single tool is Evernote because that's where I'm able to store all of the different links and and screenshots and explanations and PDFs and receipts and all of the other loose things that float around my life that are made of paper or of digital stuff. So that's, you know, if there's one tool that's sort of a day-to-day -day tool that I find most useful, that, that, would be, uh, that would be Evernote. Okay, um, so I'm gonna jump into the next section, which is uh, about some snazzy new tools. Um, I see a question from Terry, so I'll just, um, I'll just answer that um, before moving forward. Um, and uh, the question is about, will you have access to the presentation and or list? Yes, definitely, you'll have access to that. You already have access to that, actually. If you go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash ninja next, that link will take you to all of these links that I'm mentioning, as well as um, the slides, so you have full access to it. Um, you can use it at your leisure. Um, and, um, and a nice comment from Rashonda. I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. Um, and um, I appreciate the, the positive comment. Thanks for your, your feedback. Um, and if other people have questions, feel free to continue adding them. I'm going to jump into the next section on, on these new tools. And um, you know, the first thing I want to mention is that we're moving beyond you know, just the cameras on our smartphones. That, that, that was kind of a revelation a couple of years ago that we could all take these great pictures on our cameras and videos and even record audio. And now there's all this new stuff that we can do. So I'm going to just mention a few of these cool new things. One are these lenses that attach to the camera. So it's great to have a great smartphone camera, but all your lens and some other um, new lenses that have come out allow you to do really cool stuff, like fisheye pictures, wide-angle pictures, um, zoom, and macro pictures. And it's all with this little, tiny little lens that fits in your pocket. And it's not that expensive. If you're really interested in high-quality photography, um, it's not much more expensive than buying a, you know, an extra battery for your phone, for example, or, or a fancy-dancy uh, case for your iPad. So you get these great pictures like the ones I'm, I'm showing you. These are not my photos. Um, these are ones that, that Olio uses as, as example pictures. But um, you get a sense of how you can do really powerful things with these little, little lenses that just make your camera ever more powerful. And then there's a whole range of new cameras, which are really, really cool. This one's called Bubble. And it takes 360 degree um, photographs. It's a 360 degree camera, and it's it's actually um, just a first stage product. So you know it's not necessarily the same lens quality as you see on a top quality Canon DSLR, for example. But it takes really interesting pictures. And if you go to their website bubl.io, um, you'll see a gallery of really cool um, images and, and videos that are taken using this camera. There's also 360.tv uh, camera, which is a similar kind of idea, 360 photography. And you can see it was funded on um, Kickstarter at over a million dollars. And it's just a really, really cool HD 360 camera. And it's an example of how 
cameras and, and equipment is changing, you know, how that kind of stuff is changing really quickly. And it does all kinds of cool stuff. You can see noted here, like GPS geotagging. Um, it can stabilize images even when it's moving around, um, etc. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this video on my screen, and uh, and I want to make sure we get through as much stuff as possible. So um, I'm going to let you watch the videos on those sites on your own. Um, and the links, as I said, are in the uh, shared doc. Another type of image and tool, um, image tool that people are using increasingly are drones. And as we know, there's, there are a lot of legal issues, legal questions uh, surrounding that. But um, but I think that it has huge potential, assuming that, that the legal issues get straightened out and, and journalists are able to use drones for, for journalistic purposes. One is called a Plexadrone. And uh, I want to show you a couple of images. This is what it looks like when you've got a Hero, um, a Hero GoPro camera attached to it. And you can see that it can be used in really interesting ways um, for capturing science-related or, or climate-related photos, in this case, uh, capturing really powerful images of this volcano. Um, in other cases, it can be used to capture images about um, the pollution of a particular body of water, um, as, you know, as was the case after Hurricane Katrina or other incidents. So it, drones can be used in really interesting ways to capture images that would be hard to gather. Um, mar big marches where a lot of people are marching, you can capture aerial images of a marathon or um, other cases where you want to capture a high-level high image of a lot of people gathering or uh, some natural um, body of water or something else that you want to see. Um, drones can do an interesting job of, of capturing that. And, and they're coming down in price such that you know they're, they're kind of along the lines of a fancy video game system. They're, they're not that much more expensive for the base base types. Um, so you'll see a lot more experimentation, I think, from small and large news organizations this year using these in new ways. Another kind of new camera is Lytro. Um, it's actually not brand new. The, this Lytro has been around for a few years, um, but there's a new model this year, which um, which is kind of interesting. This, If you haven't seen the Lytro, this is an example intended to show you how it works. It allows you to focus the picture after the fact. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see an image where the focus is very um, shallow on, on something very close to us. And then, and then um, manually, the, the user can shift the focus to focus on something more distant. So it, it's a camera that allows you to focus after the fact. And the original version that you see in this slide uh, looks kind of like a lipstick tube, about the size of a lipstick tube if it were square. But then there's a new version that's Granted, a little bit more expensive. It's over $1,000, but it looks more like a camera, a regular camera, and has more of the regular camera functions. So for serious photographers, it, it offers some really interesting new capabilities. And I just saw, actually, last week that there's an app. And uh, I'll add this to the doc um, when I have a chance. There's an app um, for the iPhone that actually replicates this kind of functionality so that you can take a picture with your iPhone and, after the fact, adjust the focus, which is kind of interesting. Obviously, the GoPro cameras are getting more and more powerful. So there's a whole range of these new kinds of cameras that are doing interesting things. Uh, and this screen, you're seeing a different kind of camera, which are these life logging cameras. And that's a new thing also, increasingly um, popular this year, which these are cameras that basically take constant photos so that you can look back on your life as a stream of, of um, micro events. And not everyone wants to capture every moment of your life, obviously, but um, we had a student who was interested for a, um, a grandparent that had um, Alzheimer's in allowing her to track her day and look back on her day because she otherwise would forget things as they happened. And so he was working on ways of using that in a journalistic way and in a healthcare kind of way to help people um, experiencing memory loss. So there's interesting ways people are using these, and, um, and it's, a, it's a, I think, an exciting new, new arena for wearable cameras. One other tool I think we'll see more and more of is this iFi style Wi-Fi camera sharing. Uh, this, the Canon 70Ds already have this built-in Wi-Fi connection, so you can now use a high-quality camera with a high-quality DSL, uh, DSLR lens, etc., but still have the sharing capability that we have on our smartphones, so the best of both worlds. So that's a pretty exciting thing um, to be able to use the high-quality camera and to um, and to be able to share the pictures. Um, so I am going to uh, I'm going to stop sharing the webcam because um, I want to make sure you just see the uh, the slides. Um, and and um, again, feel free to keep asking questions. I'm going to keep plowing through these um, 
these things. Um, another, so we're, we're on the, 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 we're in the area of hardware and new tools, and I've showed you a bunch of different kinds of cameras. One thing that's not a camera, it's a LiveScribe pen. There's actually a new version of this pen that you see in the foreground of this image. And basically, it's a digital pen that allows you to take notes in a digital way. So you're using paper and pen, which many of us like to use. But because you're using a special notebook um, or special paper, and actually, you can print out this paper on any printer. You don't have to buy the notebooks. But because you're using the special pen and the special paper, you can take notes that are then synced through Wi-Fi to your computer. Um, and that's nice because you have a digitized version of your notes. But it's, it does more than that. It allows you also to, to record audio and to sync that audio with the part of your notes where that audio is recorded. So if you're interviewing, let's say, 10 different people about something, you can jot down your notes for each of the people. And then when you want, later on, just touch that part of the notepad and return to that person's voice for the, who, who was answering those questions. So it allows you to combine, combine audio and digital notes in, in interesting ways. Um, you can also share your notes. You can embed them. You can share the audio with people. So um, for journalists who are interested in transparency and sharing our notes and process with the public, there can be some interesting uses of this. OK, um, the next arena is uh, what, I, what I'm calling social sourcing. It's a bit of a tongue twister, social sourcing. Let's try saying that 10 times quickly. Um, and this is about spotting stories before they go viral. So we all know, as journalists and media professionals, that we can look to Facebook for trends, and we can look to Twitter for trends, and we can look to a lot of social outlets to see things that are going viral, uh, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or Vine or other networks. But there are some interesting new tools that let us do things in a slightly different way. And that means that we can, in some cases, discover things before they're massively viral. Um, and that can be useful if we want to be a little bit ahead of the curve, and we want to share things before they go viral, or we want to be part of the, the viral spread. So CrowdTangle is an example of one of these platforms. And this is a platform which essentially takes a look at Facebook pages and takes note of things that are shockingly above average in terms of how many people from that group, from that page, are sharing that item, liking that item, or commenting on that item. So for example, in this item right here, we're looking at sports content, just as an example. And there's a post here, a Sports Illustrated post, where it's performing 25 times the, the normal um, in terms of um, its interaction. So it's got a lot more likes than the normal. You can see it's got 5,140 likes. That's far ahead of what it normally does. It's also got a lot more comments than it normally, um, than a post at that time of day for that particular Facebook page would have. And it's also got many, many more shares. It's got 707 more shares than, uh, than other posts on average for that particular page. So it's a way to spot things that are overperforming, outperforming. Um, and depending on your sector, you can use CrowdTangle. It's not a free tool, by the way. It's a subscription tool. And it's used by places like Upworthy and BuzzFeed and Time Inc. And it's used for, by them because they realize that they can identify things that are popping up in different subject areas. And they can then write about them or share them with their audience before they've gone massively viral. So they're starting to go viral, but just at the early stages. And you can set up alerts so that you get notified anytime, for example, your competitor has something which is outperforming, or anytime someone that you're covering is featured in an outperforming post. Um, and it's just Facebook at this point, but it's growing to other networks in the future. So um, you can see here that it can be used to identify kind of things that are popular. You can also look at things um, that, um, that are from very specific list of Facebook pages that you choose. It doesn't have to be by subject area. You can say, I want to look at these 10 Facebook pages or these 50 Facebook pages. And I want to know anytime something on one of these pages is buzzing up, is, is getting above uh, average number of comments, likes, or shares. So that's CrowdTangle. Um, another example of, of a tool like that, and this one you can use for free um, to a limited extent, is called NewsWhip. And NewsWhip has a premium version um, called Spike. But NewsWhip itself allows you to see what's trending in different countries, on different subject, in different subject areas. And you can see here, if you look at this slide, you can see there's a W number, 
which sort of shows how viral it is. In other words, how many people above average are sharing it on Facebook or Twitter. And so it gives you a sense of kind of the buzzing news in different countries and in different subject areas. And uh, very useful if you're trying to be on top of news and trying to be ahead of viral uh, stuff. Another way, another tool resource that I really like in this arena, it's slightly different, um, but for keeping track of trends, this is the best resource that I know of. Um, it's called trendwatching.com. And there's a free newsletter you can subscribe to, and the website has a lot of free stuff about new trends and has really, really cool examples, great for kind of coming up with trend ideas and trend pieces. And a lot of these sites use these kinds of tools. Upworthy does, BuzzFeed does. And um, if you want to take advantage of some of the things, some of the tricks of the trade that they use, um, these social sourcing tools are a way to do that. So uh, we're a little more than halfway through, so I'm going to plow forward. I'm going to move quickly through some of this stuff. Um, but again, feel free to drop in a question if you have one or a comment if you'd like. I'm, I'm happy to stop and, and answer those or, or respond to those. Secret Stories is something that's growing in interest um, this year and, and has been growing this past year. There, there's kind of a backlash to oversharing on Facebook and to stuff that people are kind of tired of seeing on social media. We all have our own personal pet peeves about what we don't like seeing on social media, on Facebook and, and Twitter, etc. Um, and so part of what's happening now is people are moving to these private networks and sharing with either secret groups, private groups, or groups of people with like interests so that they're not bothered by stuff that's irrelevant to them or stuff they're tired of seeing. And some of these networks include Yik Yak and Secret. Super is another new one. Facebook has a new app called Rooms, where you can see rooms on particular topics um, that you're interested in on your phone. You can participate in specific subject discussions. Uh, Whisper is another one. Um, so there's a whole range of these. And um, and the, they include uh, a few other secret message services like Wicker and Telegram, Confide. So there's a whole range of these. Um, of course, Snapchat was an early um, predecessor of many of these. And in some cases, they're focused on allowing you to send secret messages or private messages, as in this latter group. In the other cases that I just mentioned with Secret and Yik Yak and Whisper and Rooms and Super, they're more about anonymous sharing and sharing kind of thoughts and ideas with people. They're, of course, subject to abuse in some cases for teens, you know, bullying each other and so forth. So th there's some controversy around them. Um, but they can also be interesting in terms of tapping into a zeitgeist or a sense of what people are thinking or feeling in particular subject areas. This next trend area that I want to mention is, is about sort of the changing nature in which people share content. And, and I think the appeal of individual blogs is starting to fade. And it's not to say that people aren't blogging. There are many people who still do. But I think what people are moving more towards is, are these shared platforms like Medium, for example, where people can share their blog posts, as it were, in a beautifully designed interface. And there's built-in sharing because a lot of people are on that same platform, much as a lot of people are on Twitter. Um, but unlike Twitter, which is limited to, to a small number of characters, Medium allows you to share an idea in, in its full form without having to direct people to go to your own blog. They can just go to Medium as they might otherwise go to see lots of ideas. So Medium has, a, has become a really great place, a kind of central meeting spot for great content. And you see really high quality posts from a wide range of, of uh, authors and writers and individuals and experts and ordinary people, as well as journalists. And they allow you to tell stories in really quite elegant ways. I think that the design and medium is top notch and, and actually looks better than many blogs look and requires no time or effort or cost in setting it up. So I think that's the direction that blogging is moving towards, it's these shared kinds of platforms. And Medium is one of them. It's not necessarily going to be the only one or the last one. Cowbird is another platform um, that allows you to tell visual stories and add audio or add text. It's by Jonathan Harris, a technology expert and artist who's done some wonderful projects like We Feel Fine. And this is his newest project. And it's actually not brand new, but it's expanded. And it's really kind of um, become a wonderful place to find great content and to tell simple, beautiful stories. Here's an example of a, of a Cowbird page. And uh, stories that are told on Cowbird are, are, are visually engaging, 
and uh, and it's again a way to tell a story with a community or to a community or alongside a community as opposed to having your own blog where you might have to struggle to get traffic um, for many individuals. There are lots of other new platforms um, that are trying to create a new way to blog. Ghost is one. Subtle is another one. Rune, R-O-O-N, Postagon. So there are other new kinds of blogging and blogging tools and platforms for sharing content. And I think one thing they tend to have in common is an emphasis on design. So you don't have to be a designer. You can kind of use these platforms and have an elegantly designed blog. Um, but one of the challenges for tools that allow you to create your own site is that you still have to get people to your site. You can share it through Twitter and Facebook, of course. But the advantage of shared platforms like Cabard and Medium is that there's a natural flow of people searching for stuff, looking for stuff, finding stuff that's related to other stuff they're reading. This next, next area is about audio. So we've talked about pictures and, and blogging and, and video. This is about audio. And I'm sure most of you, if not all of everyone on this um, webinar has has heard about Serial, uh, possibly heard about Startup and other new hot podcasts. And um, new networks are really rising quickly. Podcasts are kind of the hot thing. And as a result, there's a lot of people rushing to create some cool new stuff um, for your ears. And these are some examples of networks that I think are worth checking out. Soundworks, Radiotopia, Infinite Guest. Not everything works out, so Mule Radio Syndicate was one, and that's kind of gone under, as it were, unfortunately. But Radiotopia is a big new one from PRX, which is the public radio exchange, which is a major new um, network of shows. Infinite Guest is a really cool one, as is Soundworks. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting stuff coming out. Um, <coughs> these are examples of podcasts that I think are really cool and worth listening to and kind of point the direction for 2015. I'm sure you've, many of you have heard Serial already. They're going to have season two coming up. By the way, I doubt it's going to be another criminal story. That's that's something that people have, have uh, sort of, um, in many cases, assumed. But I think they're going to go in a different direction and tell a serial story of a different sort. Startup is a great podcast um, by Alex Bloomberg about the process of starting something up. And he started Gimlet Media, which is a whole new podcast company. And uh, The Truth is one which is fiction stories, but really beautifully done and, and um, shows the power of audio. They call it movies for your ears, and that's a personal favorite of mine. So a lot of new audio um, will be coming our way in 2015, and a really exciting way um, to find new journals and new stories and stuff that you can enjoy on the go. I'm in New York listening on the subway, for example, and other people are listening in their cars or walking, and you can do something else, wash your dishes or whatever, while listening, which is not something you can always do with, with video or reading. So micro design. This is about mobile um, mobile projects. A lot of new stuff in 2015 we'll see designed for mobile first. Circa is one that's done really a great job. They're on version 3.0, which is really really nice and elegant. Watch up, terrific way to watch video rather than watching one newscast. You can curate your own newscast with hundreds of different bits of uh, video from different outlets that you like. Um, you can watch it on your on your computer, on your phone, on your tablet, even on your video game device, and it's free. It's a really, really cool, cool project, cool app. AJ Plus, a good example of a beautiful app that engages people um, in news in a, in a very mobile-friendly way. It's not just articles slapped into a phone. It's designed just for a phone. Um, and a lot of apps that allow you to create your own stuff on the phone in, in interesting ways. Replay is one of my favorite for creating automatic videos. You just choose some videos and pictures from your camera roll, and presto, it creates this really cool video that looks like it's you spent hours creating, and it's it's uh, it's really easy to, to super easy to use. There's nothing you need to know. You can get started, and um, and it's basically free. Um, this is an example um, of a quick one, just as a demo of something created out of a few little random videos from my camera roll and a couple pictures and uh, drops on Creative Commons licensed music for you and uh, puts it together, adds a filter if you want. So really easy to use. Some other tools I like, um, Foster, for, for, this is for mobile, designing stuff for mobile. You can create these cool little graphics, posters, designs using Foster, P-H-O-S-T-E-R. It's not free, but it's just, I think, uh, $2. Um, I love Photogene for editing and Snapseed, so you can just swipe left and right. It makes beautiful use of the phone or, or tablet screen to edit photos or images. 
And um, these are some of the other apps I really like on mobile, in case you're interested. Um, Refresh is a great app if you are trying to find out um, basic info about people you're meeting with or people you're working with. Um, it gives you some background info um, drawn from social media and from public um, Google searches and a uh, range of other tools that I find useful. Instapaper is my go-to reading app whenever I am reading something online and can't finish it. I save it to, uh, to Instapaper. I'm going to breeze through these last couple of categories um, and then uh, pause for some questions in the last few minutes. I hope this is uh, useful. And um, this category is about wearable news. So, you know, wearables, everyone's talking about the Apple iWatch in 2015 set to be released in a couple months. But I think there's still a ways to go in making these devices um, more useful and more a part of our lives. The uh, Fitbit is one that I had, I bought, and I'll confess, it's now sitting in a drawer. And I read recently that I'm not alone in that regard, that I think two-thirds, somewhere around two-thirds of um, owners of these devices end up using them for a period of months and then set them aside. So I think the problem is that we get this data, and it's not clear what we do with that data. And there's not much that we can do with it other than just look at it and say, oh, I walked this number of steps today. So I think the next era of this stuff is actually stuff that you can use and, and insight that you can use to change your behavior. Um, and, and maybe the Apple iWatch will start to, to help with that, although I think it'll take a year or two before we get to a, a version that's a little bit more actionable, a little bit more useful. Um, the first version of the Apple iWatch, you'll probably have to have your phone with you. Um, and I think in, in subsequent years, you, you won't necessarily, so that will make a difference um, as well. There are a couple of things that are moving forward in this regard that are trying to be more actionable. This is a, a wearable that tries to help you conquer stress. So that might be more useful than just knowing how many steps you, you're taking, something that can kind of monitor your stress level and help you address that stress. Um, Lumo Lift, I've tried the Lumo, the previous version, the Lumo Back device, which helps with posture. I tend to, to slouch a lot, and the Lumo actually gives you a little buzz, uh, kind of like a digital nanny gives you a little buzz to tell you that uh, you might want to stand up straight. So this is a device that actually can help you if you want to practice or improve your posture. And this one um, helps you kind of get an understanding of where your mind's at, if you're focused, if you're relaxed. This is part of a new generation of devices that, uh, that try to give you data about how you're thinking and feeling. This category is about personalization. I think there are a lot of interesting new projects that allow you to see stuff that's very specific to you. So Nuzzle is an example of stuff that is shared by your friends, people you're, you're connected to on Twitter and Facebook, um, and it's telling you what are people that you're connected to, what are they sharing most. So it's really news from your friends, as they put it. Um, I like a lot Prismatic. Um, that has some really fantastically well-tailored um, articles for, for you based on what you're interests are and what your friends are sharing, etc. Um, Reverb is another example of a project like that. Flipboard does a nice job of that now in its new version where you can choose the categories and find stuff that interests you. Refresh, I mentioned briefly earlier, um, does a great job of finding information about people I'm meeting with. This is a, a friend of mine and uh, in advance of chatting with him recently, a, a business meeting we were going to have, um, it gave me a quick alert about what he was up to and what his professional interests were and so forth. So uh, Refresh is a cool app, a free app for the iPhone. Um, lots of new revenue streams, and that's part of what's changing in 2015 in the media. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but you're going to see a lot of new ways that businesses, media businesses, are, are making money, um, providing courses in some cases. Um, the Washington Post, I think, um, is an example of an organization you might see um, trying some of this, and, and various others will be doing more and more to expand the way that they make money. Uh, Texas Tribune already uses events, 70 events last year, um, and um, you'll see more and more experiments with different kinds of um, fundraising. Um, Narratively, which I mentioned earlier, was started here at the CUNY J School at the Town Center, Center, um, used Kickstarter to get going. And Kickstarter is going to be an increasingly important way for journalism projects that are small to, to continue getting funding, as will Beacon, which is another cool crowdfunding platform. Um, and while I'm mentioning Beacon, I'll put in a quick plug for our demo night coming up on um, Tuesday, January uh, 27th, where Beacon will be presenting, as will um, a bunch of other uh, cool projects. 
if you go to bit.ly slash startup media, you'll see uh, info about that meetup. Uncoverage is an example of an investigative crowdfunding platform. So there's uh, Indie Voices is one that's focused on international stories. So there's a bunch of new crowdfunding platforms for those of you interested in funding particular stories or work or know people who are. Um, beyond Kickstarter, there are these other options like Indie Voices and Uncoverage and uh, Beacon. Vurno is specifically crowdfunding for video journalism. So a lot of new, uh, new areas um, for crowdfunding. And uh, as we get ready to wrap up here, um, I want to mention a couple of the skills that I think are particularly valuable um, in this era um, in 2015 and moving forward. Um, I think coding is a key area. Analytics, understanding analytics, understanding social and how to build a community and how to reach out to a community and connect to the community. Um, and uh, data and design, understanding how to use data sets, how to look at data sets, analyze them, and how to design visuals that help people understand what the data is showing. I think that's a really huge set of skills that is going to be increasingly in demand this year and, and years to come. And, um, and business skills. So we at the Town Eye program are focused on entrepreneurial journalism and helping people start up new projects. And some of that is about the content, but a lot of it is about building the community and generating revenue. And, um, and those of you who are interested, we, we are starting our new program this, this, uh, the week ahead, this coming week. But, um, but we'll be having some online programs in the year ahead and, uh, and then another in-person program um, at the beginning of uh, 2016. So um, please be in touch with me if that's of interest to you. There are lots of ways to brush up on these skills um, that I've mentioned just now. Um, Skill Crush is a great example of a tool for brushing up on tech skills that's aimed at women um, and men, actually. Um, and there are lots and lots of other really cool um, ways to, um, to brush up and strengthen your skills in, in, in these areas. Uh, this is a trend that I think we'll see more and more of. Um, it's kind of interesting to me. It's, it's, um, I call it um, bionic publishing, and basically it's about bots writing stories. Um, this is an example of a story created by a computer based on some earnings, an earnings report. This is one about uh, football, um, about a, um, a, sorry, a fantasy um, football league generated exclusively by a computer. So, um, and this is an earthquake story where um, the LA Times used an algorithm to alert, um, to create a, a basically a, a, a quick story, um, which as you can see, the, the story is dated 5.36 a.m. And, um, and this earthquake took place, if you look in the article, at 5.28 a.m. So within eight minutes, this algorithm had basically generated and posted this article so that people would know about this earthquake. And the reporters can then write longer versions, update it, et cetera. But this is an example of an algorithm being used by a major news organization to, to tell a story. You can use these kinds of triggers and algorithms um, in a free way with some tools like IFTTT, which stands for If This Then That. So if you go to IFTTT.com, you can connect your feeds and news sources to various publishing tools. So for example, you can set something up that um, will save all of your bit.ly links into a Google spreadsheet, or which will um, save all of the Facebook pictures you post into a Flickr album or any range of other things you can do. It's pretty powerful. And um, here are a couple examples of things that you can do with, with, um, with uh, IFTTT. There's actually a really cool new app for the iPhone that allows you to do something along these lines. Um, and um, it allows you to create these very simple kinds of recipes um, on your phone. So this is moving beyond Trello to, um, to our phones as well. It's called Workflow, the one I have in mind, and it's a couple dollars. Um, but it allows you to create automatic recipes on your phone to create to do different things. So a few resources, those of you who are interested in following these kinds of new startups, Beta List is a great one for cool new stuff that's coming out, as is Product Hunt. And there's a really cool new board. Um, it's not actually brand new, but it's increased. It's growing in, in size and scope called um, Journalism Tools by one of my former students, Ezra Eman. And if you go to Pinterest.com slash Journalism Tools, you'll see lots and lots of curated um, lists of tools in various areas, um, including a couple of the ones that I've mentioned today. So uh, I'm going to wrap up there and, um, and open up for questions in these waning moments. 
Um, I'm happy to um, to take questions on anything that you're interested in. <coughs> and again, I want to remind you that the links to all of these sites that I mentioned today are at bit.ly slash Ninja Next, and I'm on Twitter at Jeremy Kaplan with a C and tweeting about this stuff, so follow me if you want to keep up with some of the stuff that I've mentioned or the stuff that, that I think is coming next. And I'd love to hear from you with any feedback, um, any thoughts, any additional suggestions. Um, and I'm going to just take any final questions as we get ready to, to wrap up here. I see another comment from Terry. Um, and. Uh, Asking about CrowdTangle, um, yes, you can use CrowdTangle to um, to search for very specific kinds of topics, um, and uh, and you can really customize it to work in the way you want. So, for example, you can even say you want to look at stuff that's outperforming, not in terms of shares, but in terms of comments. So that means that you're mainly interested in stuff that is really generating a lot of response, or you can say. I want stuff that is being liked a lot because there's some reason people are really liking it. So you can customize your dials as you as you are you know as you see fit. So other questions or um, comments? Well, just, Any last? Uh, I just have a comment. Um, I just want to wish Jeremy a happy early birthday. I downloaded the Refresh app and it told me that his birthday was in three <laughs> three days. So oh, that's, that's an example of how this app can help you connect with people. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kirita. Yeah, that's it's it's funny how you know even if you know someone, if you have a meeting with them and you use Refresh, it'll pop up some fact or some thing that you don't know. Um, invariably, I, I always find it really useful before meetings, especially with people you don't know well. But even with people you know, it, it'll just remind you of something that you may not have thought of. One other thing I'll mention about Refresh, which I really like, is um, you know I'm often asked to make an introduction, I'll, or I'll want to introduce a student to someone else who might be helpful to them, and I can use Refresh to basically choose both people, and it'll generate an automatic intro email. I can edit it, but it sort of puts in their basic info and a little background on both of them, which is a task that you know in other cases can take 10, 15, 20 minutes um, to gather that stuff and put it in an email and edit it together. So I like that aspect of Refresh as well. Any other questions um, from anyone anyone uh, about any of the sites or any of the tools or any of the services or, or even anything not related to the, the subject of the webinar um, directly? I'm happy to, to hear your, your questions. I'll, I'll stick around for another five minutes or so um, in case people have questions or thoughts. Um, I see um, that... Uh, Looks like we've answered the ones in this box, so um, so I'll wait and see if there are any other uh, any other questions. You can also email me if anyone wants to email me offline. <coughs> I mean, off of this line, as it were. So it's Jeremy at JeremyKaplan.com, and it's Kaplan with a C. If anyone has follow-up questions or you want to get in touch with me about um, anything related to Town Night or or the CUNY J School, um, so I just pasted my email again in the uh, in the chat area in case that's of use to anyone. Um, and getting in touch with me. Well, let's definitely thank you, Jeremy. Like once again, this has been an amazing one hour power pack, like packed with so many tools that I want to go back and look at. So I have something to do this weekend. Um, Great. Yeah. Thanks Kirata, for setting this up and thanks everyone for, for uh, taking some time and joining. I hope it's been useful and I'd love to hear from you if you have any other feedback or want to share anything with me um, in the future. And uh, thanks for your attention and time. And we also recorded it so we can make it available to for people to watch later. Okay. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Have a great have a great weekend everyone.